Good afternoon for those who are just uh, logging on to Zoom. We're really excited to have you here today. My name is Gary Painter, and I serve as the director of the Price Center for Social Innovation. I've been a professor in the school for 26 years, and I also direct the Homelessness Policy Research Institute in Los Angeles. Our mission at the Price Center is to develop ideas and illuminate strategies to improve the quality of life for people living in low-income urban communities. And we do this through our, our, we accomplish our mission through our teaching, our research, and working with community partners. Today, we're kicking off our 10th anniversary celebration, um, our Social Innovation Summit series. Um, and just to give you some background on the Price Center, we have, you know, we were established in 2011 when the Price Philanthropies made a transformative donation to name the school, the Price School of Public Policy. The gift also established the Soul Price Center for Social Innovation with the goal of accomplishing the mission I outlined before. As we celebrate our 10th anniversary this year, we're hosting a series of online events um, to focus on how social innovation can help catalyze systemic change in areas like criminal justice, education, and housing, as well as broad issues of inequality, which are the core research areas of the Price Center. On April 27th, we're going to host a culminating in-person event to mark the end of this series. Um, and you can learn more and register for each one of these events on our website. So today's event examines how the processes and models of social innovation can be used to reverse the centuries-long history of racism and economic discrimination within the criminal legal system. Um, what we're going to do um, is just briefly make sure that everyone has the same kind of level set, um, understanding a little bit about what the field of social innovation is and how it interacts with the criminal legal system. So Stacia, if you'd put up our slides uh, to get started, I will do that. And then I will um, have the privilege of introducing Dr. Brittany Friedman, who's going to present some of her research and then moderate a panel. So what is social innovation? For many who are in our community, you, you're familiar with this or other definitions of social innovation, but I think it's important to highlight um, how social innovation is a process. It's an iterative inclusive process that generates more effective and just solutions to solve complex social problems. This is a definition that three of the faculty who are part of the center um, developed over a couple of years engaging with the field. And I think it really highlights the place where we contribute to the field of social innovation. Um, it is true in some areas that traditional policy approaches have failed to catalyze systemic change. Um, to that end, social innovation can provide an alternative to, to these traditional problem-solving approaches that may have worked in, in many areas, but, but not in the ones that are most intransigent. Uh, next slide, please. So the process of, of, of social innovation, as, as this graphic illustrates, is, is iterative in the sense that you are trying to come up with ideas to learn quickly. Um, and you can see that as you move from initial phases to diffusion into systems, there's always you know, kind of a posture of learning and, move, and redesigning. I think what's important as well to highlight is this first step of co-production, um, which really signals who needs to be involved in the creation of these solutions. Um, so as we come together and maybe, you know, approach things with design thinking approaches and early innovation pilot approaches, we understand that we're going to really try to think differently, include people who are themselves have lived experience of whatever the issue is, um, and include people who also hold economic and social and political power levers, because if the ultimate goal is to see systemic change, all have to be included. We also have the, the bias, if you will, to use that word, that perhaps one of the reasons that solutions haven't been engaged in is because we've not been actually activating the voices of people that likely have ideas and solutions. And that's why it's so important to include people who actually have lived experience and systems that are currently generating harm or at the very least, not producing the outcomes we'd like. So next slide, please. 
So today we're looking at the intersection between social innovation and the criminal justice or criminal legal system. And I think two motivating questions here that came to my mind are, first, are the current outcomes that we're observing in the criminal legal system best in any sense, any kind of normative sense? And I think we can emphatically say that the outcomes that we observe today are neither just or effective at achieving the public safety outcomes that communities want. Uh, secondly, I think it's important to ask this question, you know, should we engage in a social innovation process? So are the issues at hand persistent? Are they complex? And do they deserve the social innovation approaches that we're going to be speaking a little bit about here today? And we invite you to join us at the Price Center to spend more time learning about them. And so to that end, I think it's, again, pretty clear that Yes, social innovation approaches are warranted. And so on the next slide, I just wanted to kind of give you just a few places where, you know, there's much work to be done, but I just listed four because it fit in one slide. We know that there are issues with how um, community members interact with the police. We know that African-Americans are three times as likely to be stopped, for instance, as members of other race and ethnic groups, no matter what neighborhoods they may be residing in. This is a problem. We know that sentencing practices are themselves also not just or effective in many cases. We know that punishment practices are also suffer from these flaws. And then, therefore, there are multiple barriers that we've reinforced so that people who are coming out of a carceral situation from jail, from prison, as they reenter into the labor market and the housing market, they face with just really critical barriers. Now, it's worth saying that a lot of these issues that are in front of us were due to not, in some sense, an accident, if you will, but actually we pursued policies to generate challenges and disproportionate impacts and unjust impacts on populations, especially those populations who are ethnic and racial minorities. And to that end, we're really excited to have the group who are going to be leading us in a conversation, a place to learn today, um, and certainly focus a lot of our conversation on the last two boxes that, that are here, but I know that questions and, and people can comment on all the way across the spectrum of first contact to potentially probation and last contact with the criminal legal system. So with that, we can uh, lower my slide deck, Stacia, and I'd like to introduce Brittany Friedman to you. It's my pleasure to um, share her with a broader audience. She is new to USC. Um, she's Dr. Brittany Friedman is an assistant professor in sociology. That's our Dornside College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. And she is a scholar of punishment and social control. She researches race and prison order and equality mobilization against the carceral state and the criminal legal system actually as an economic market, which is something that until I met her, I was unaware of. Um, her full bio is available on the event page. So that's all I will say. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Friedman and afterwards our panelists here today. Thank you so much, Gary, for that introduction. Um, it is wonderful to be here today with everyone. I'm really excited to have this conversation because we are going to deconstruct some of the many ways that the U.S. criminal legal system is truly marked by systemic harms and what we would consider to be networked consequences for communities that span all social institutions. And so to get us started and to kind of kick off this conversation um, with the panel, I wanted to share some of my work with collaborators um, that we've done in this area and as it relates to what we would consider to be the predatory dimensions of the criminal legal system. And so what do I mean when I say predation? Um, we could argue that predation is the act of plundering and extracting from individuals and communities. And one of the main ways that predation manifests in the criminal legal system is through the imposition and recruitment of monetary sanctions. Monetary sanctions are legal financial obligations, and they include uh, obligations such as fines or fees, restitution, interest, surcharges, and there's a, a whole host of other costs that are imposed for a myriad of offenses. And this can range from traffic violations 
and misdemeanors to all felonies, and also includes potential costs for time spent in jail and or prison. And so the figure that I have here on the slide is showing a typical bill that someone would receive at the time of conviction um, by the state. And so it's showing a whole host of fees that go to all of these different government funds. And that's actually an interesting finding that my colleague and I found with this work is that many of these fees are going to state funds that have nothing to do with the original conviction. Um, and we started really following the money flows. Uh, in particular, this is for Illinois, to see where, who, who, where are all of these fees going? Where is the money at? Like, how is it actually funding the system? And we found that it goes well beyond just funding the criminal legal system. Um, and so as of 2021, based on data from only 25 states, um, the Fines and Fees Justice Center reports that at least $27.6 billion of fines and fees is actually owed by individuals that are ensnared by the criminal legal system across the United States. And so if we had data on the other half of the country, imagine what the total outstanding debt would be. And so this issue of predation in the criminal legal system really hit national news after the 2014 police shooting of a Black teenager in Ferguson, Missouri, um, by the name of Mike Brown. And so the racial uprisings and the protests against the criminal legal system that began after his slaying were to protest both police brutality, but also the system of predatory policing through monetary sanctions that was rampant in Ferguson. And so this drew the attention of the U.S. Department of Justice, which investigated the city of Ferguson and found that monetary sanctions in that jurisdiction were exploitative and led to these cycles of over-policing um, to generate revenue and the hyper-incarceration of the Black residents in the community. And so, for example, their report found that in 2015, Black residents in Ferguson made up 67% of the city's population, but accounted for 85% of its vehicle stops, 90% of its citations, and 93% of its arrests. And so given that our country is the largest incarcerator of the world and disproportionately entraps low income and communities of color, the most important question for my colleagues and I are who, who actually pays for the exponential ballooning of the criminal legal system and its justice institutions? And so according to a 2017 prison policy investigation, the system of mass incarceration costs the government and system ensnared individuals and their families at least $182 billion annually. Our research and that of our colleagues working in this area has shown that as correctional populations began to rise, and at the same time, states were experiencing the fiscal crises that were impacting all institutions of the 1980s. In order to cut costs over time, states began to expand their use of monetary sanctions in the forms of fines and fees. And so it is the same communities that are over incarcerated that are saddled with the financial debt they allegedly owe to the criminal legal system for monetary sanctions. And this is because this pervasive use of these sanctions has re resulted in attempts to shift the financial burden away from the state, away from departments of corrections, and explicitly lawmakers will say away from taxpayers to those that are in contact with the system. Um, and the logic of this that we've actually seen in legislative debates are um, lawmakers making arguments that people should literally pay back their debt to society, not just with their physical extraction from the community, but with coin. Um, and as I noted earlier, often these funds are not just ending up in the hands of DOC or police departments, but they're being distributed across states' general funds to fund general expenditures like the construction of roads, for example, we found in Illinois. So 
My team and I, we've looked at this system broadly, but we've also tried to ascertain um, what are the shifting logics and costs as it relates to certain types of monetary sanctions. And so for the rest of this um, overview, I'm going to focus on a specific type of monetary sanction that doesn't actually tend to get that much um, kind of uh, uh, publicity, or if you will, the right word would be attention, um, uh, depending upon the audience. And so the, the predatory shift in costs um, as it relates to trying to fund mass incarceration has led to the expansion of a little known sanction known as pay to stay. Um, and so pay to stay, it refers to the practice of charging incarcerated individuals for the cost of being detained in jail and or incarcerated in prison. And what this does is it essentially creates a captive market, right? So they are physically captive within a, a confined institution, but also structurally they are captive and that they, can, they are being forced to pay for their own um, physical captivity. And so at all 50 states actually have some type of pay to stay law on their books, whether it's for room and board fees, uh, which are usually charged at a daily rate um, between 50 all the way up to $80 a day um, or medical medical fees. Um, and then the other costs that are, I would say, more commonly known, such as telephone calls or a commissary. So in order to understand um, what makes pay to stay unique or how it is also representative of the system, um, my colleagues and I, we, um, we co-lead the comparative study of pay to stay. And so our study has, has sought to um, shed light on how pay to stay functions in these three jurisdictions, um, but we are also looking to add more states, which I will talk about in, in a moment. But the way that um, we um, achieve this is by one, looking at civil complaints on behalf of attorney generals against incarcerated defendants. So what this means is that um, all of the states I mentioned, they allow for the state attorney general to actually sue incarcerated people um, or sue people who are newly released in order to compel pay to stay payments. Um, and so with our data set, in addition to transcripts of legislative debates, we were able to FOIA the attorney generals in these three states and um, have them grant us the full case files of their lawsuits. And so what have we learned? Um, it's a huge project, uh, and so it's ongoing, but we have learned quite a few important things, which I will, will go through. Um, first, Significantly, we've learned um, when do pay to stay laws expand and what, uh, what can help us understand their punitiveness and amendments, amendments such as uh, lawmakers trying to make it more difficult for people to claim they cannot pay, for example. And so what we've learned, um, this is a, a work that we published um, a couple years ago, we learned that um, historically, modern and contemporary pay to stay statutes were adopted and expanded in the United States amidst moments of fiscal crisis. And lawmakers were actually debating who should pay for what they called the correctional arm of the welfare state. And so they lumped in prisons and public hospitals and jails and were um, debating whether or not the state should have to pay and ultimately deciding that it should be the people who've caused their placement, um, in quotes I put, who've caused their placement in the system, they should have to pay. Second, we've also learned that lawmakers routinely justify imposing pay to stay fees by framing incarceration as a commodity um, and actually uh, using language like um, like pay to stay or, or incarceration is a hotel bill um, and using these uh, euphemisms to try to create what they call an incarceration liability. And so on the um, slide is an example of a typical bill in the state of Illinois that someone would have received and you can see how they've itemized it. Um, and uh, this is also used as evidence in lawsuits against people in terms of how much they owe. We've also learned that there's a great deal of surveillance 
um, much more so than other types of monetary sanctions in order to to uh, force disclosure of assets, which was interesting to us. Um, so on the slide, you'll actually see what is called the offender financial status report. And it's basically, um, it's a common practice across all states. It's a declaration form where people are required at intake to list all of their assets. And so you can see this person is, is listing all of their assets um, because uh, there is a penalty of not being eligible for parole if you do not fill out the form or if you are found to have omit something or are accused of lying on the form. We also found in terms of surveillance, um, there is a great deal of monitoring of what they're calling inmate trust funds. Uh, there's different names in different states, but there is a great deal of monitoring. And this is an example from a lawsuit against a person who, because they had a series of small deposits in their trust fund, it actually triggered a six-figure lawsuit against them for the full amount of their incarceration for several years. Um, and this was common, we found, that it that very small amounts could trigger these huge lawsuits. And the state strategy seemed to be that they would use the uh, complaint to actually then do forensic accounting and simply see if there's any more money. It's not that they know, it's they are, are trying to investigate the person. So with finding out all of this from our um, initial series of analyses, uh, we still have a lot that we don't know um, or we don't know clearly. And so it's left many questions unanswered. Um, and these are some of the areas that we are trying to investigate now um, with our current data and with our incoming data that we will be receiving from uh, Florida, for example, when they finish granting our FOIA request. Um, but issues of legal representation, uh, disability rights, um, trying to understand does prison gerrymandering relate at all to the use of pay to stay, and then also regional variation. We are currently drafting FOIA requests for these states listed on the slide um, in order to uh, add that to our study. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, before I close, um, uh, just a, a little bit about the first point on legal representation. Um, so this is actually work in progress, but right now I'm a, a fellow at the American Bar Foundation uh, for the year. And for that fellowship, I am uh, trying to understand how does uh, the legal representation of incarcerated defendants correlate to lawsuit outcomes using only the Illinois data set. And that includes 91 complete case files. And so my preliminary analysis of these files suggest that incarcerated defendants are often representing themselves or they are using the services of a jailhouse lawyer. And most often, common defenses are outright pleas for mercy. Some people using terminology as asking for mercy on the basis of being unable to pay. And so I have on the slide some uh, a couple examples of the types of responses that people write. Um, so for example, this person in DOC v. Smith uh, wrote, I am a poor person and unable to prosecute, defend this action, and am unable to pay the costs, fees, and expenses of this action. I am not currently employed due to my imprisonment. My total income for the preceding year was $100. Um, and the next suit um, in DOC v. Robbins, they responded, I pray that you don't take all my money, so I'll have money when I'm released on August 24th, 2006. I have nothing when I get out of here. I'm trying to get my life back in order. Um, and judges uh, routinely deny these claims as insufficient defense and then cite the Illinois Code of Civil Procedure and the state's right to recoup uh, civil damages. So what's really um, tricky here when it comes to the different predatory economies in the criminal legal system is they actually join different types of law where people are not guaranteed an attorney, even though the bill that they are stuck with is coming from criminal legal contact. And that is often uh, incredibly detrimental for how people are able to rebuild their lives because uh, these liens and lawsuits um, and even referring debts to uh, credit reporting, there's a whole host of civil penalties that, that they are opened up to um, uh, really just uh, decimates uh, not just them, but also their families. And what's interesting in many states, too, is that 
Um, even if the uh, person who was originally incarcerated has uh, passed away, um, their, their uh, estate, so whatever is left to their uh, dependents or their partners can be sued for um, in some states up to, to five years after they passed away. Um, so uh, to end here, I, I wanted to kind of give this, uh, I wanted to have a, a zeroed in example of the type of work that is, is really showcasing and trying to map um, predation in this system. And pay to stay is really a pernicious example of this, but a lot more work needs to be done. Um, and to conclude significantly and most recently, as you'll see on the slide, as the current pandemic rages on, um, we witnessed evidence of states like Michigan, who we have in our sample. Um, we're still analyzing our Michigan data, but we have them in our sample. Um, but Michigan seizing economic recovery stimulus checks from incarcerated people to, to settle outstanding pay to stay debt. Um, Florida, who I have on, I have Florida on the slide, um, in terms of this countersuit has this really detrimental practice of actually countersuing people who've won judgments against them for uh, misconduct or wrongful death suits um, and, and countersuing the family or the person for their pay to stay bill. Um, so I am going to end my uh, presentation here but uh, what I've tried to do with this overview is map uh, some of these aspects of this predatory economy of the criminal legal system. And I, and I only actually discussed a fraction um, and only a fraction of the consequences for communities. Uh, we are really fortunate today to have esteemed panelists that are working diligently in our region of the country to create alternatives that instead dismantle this predatory economy through first building an anti-racist economy of opportunity, and second, through creating funding streams that support an economy of life-giving institutions as opposed to harm. And so with that said, I am very honored to introduce our panelists. Jeffrey T.D. Wallace and Julio Marcial. Jeffrey is the president and CEO of Leaders Up, a nonprofit organization that impressively operationalizes social innovation through its initiatives to tackle the pressing issue of high youth unemployment in Chicago, Los Angeles, and the San Francisco Bay Area. Julio is the Vice President of Programs and Foundation Relations at Liberty Hill, a leader in social justice innovation and a laboratory for social change philanthropy. In particular, their youth and transformative justice portfolio has galvanized the reform and scope of Los Angeles County's juvenile justice system. So please uh, welcome our panelists. Uh, I'm so uh, glad to be in conversation with them. And to begin our panel discussion, I would like to start with a question for Jeffrey. Um, Jeffrey, based on the important work that you do, what does it mean to build an anti-racist economy in the wake of mass incarceration? Absolutely, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. Dr. Freeman, for the illuminating research you and your team are doing to really, really articulate and illustrate how racist our economy really is by design. Um, when we look at the intersection between the justice system, our economy, and its impact on communities of color, the data speaks for itself. So it's not an opinion. We layer in the monetization of all of this. An anti-racist economy in America really boils down to an economy where racial disparities don't exist in the areas of education, especially in alignment with the future of work, employment, ensuring folks just not have access to living wage, sustainable jobs, but career pathways that spur economic mobility, as well as um, compensation and benefits parity, where individuals have the opportunity to not just earn a wage, but grow wealth and accumulate wealth to really uh, substantiate ownership and other things and well-being, more importantly. So in the wake of the um, uh, era of mass incarceration, and especially with just the research you just shown, we really look at Leaders Up from, as a, um, from a standpoint of a national talent development accelerator focused on 
bridging the divide between anti-racist employers, so employers that are actively addressing racism by pushing um, interventions through to close racial disparities in education, employment, compensation, and benefits, and BIPOC talent, Black, Indigenous, people of color, young people between the ages of 18 and 29. And I think our, um, when we look at the, 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 the subpopulation of individuals uh, within the BIPOC category that, are in, uh, that have justice exposure, it's a tremendous amount of individuals, specifically in LA County. Uh, Dr. Painter mentioned that African Americans are three more times more likely to be arrested before the age of 21 based upon zip codes, predominantly in South LA and across East LA when we think about the county of LA County. Um, so zip codes determine the ability for someone to uh, really access opportunities and leaders up engages employers to generate transformative career pathways that spark mobility, education, mobility, economic mobility, um, and the creation of wealth. Thank you. And, and I, I was hoping too that, would you, would you be open to talking more about um, specific initiatives and how they are operationalizing social innovation to really target these root causes and the collateral consequences that um, you mentioned? Absolutely. So we're a strategic partner with the Soul Prize Center for Social Innovation. Um, and what's so fantastic about this relationship between an academic institution and the center that's driving um, in a, uh, innovation um, for that has systems uh, impact on systems change is that for an organization like Leaders Up with the mission of advancing an anti-racist economy, we have to be focused on designing innovations, but then also scaling those innovations through policy and adoption in order to really generate the systems change around education, employment, and compensation and benefits as we discussed earlier. So working with Dr. Pater and his team has really allowed us to anchor uh, the core capacity of you know, so uh, the, the Center for Social Innovation around our insights, our theory of change. We start with insights where we really want to understand the audience needs. And then from there, we go to innovation. And that's where the co-development process really is operationalized. Specifically, we've been able to take um, full, uh, a really great advantage of the policy window that was created by the work that Julio will talk about later related to shrinking the juvenile justice system here locally and building a more structure of opportunity but also just against the backdrop of George Floyd and the focus on uh, George Floyd's murder and the focus on advancing racial justice and criminal justice system reform, um, engage employers around a conversation with USC around fair chance employment. We were able to take funding through the Workforce Accelerator um, Fund, the California Workforce Development Board, that specifically focused on generating statewide innovations and approaches that advance job placement and economic mobility to co-create solutions with employers that help them interrogate developing new practices that open up opportunities for re-entering uh, citizens that are young people that were in LA County that are exposed to the juvenile justice system, but also building proximity between employers around establishing more empathy and understanding of the lived experience of the young people um, that come from the same communities that these re-entering students left, I mean, these re-entering young people left. And we were able to really understand from that process alone um, the ability that employ there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for employers to, at an enterprise level, shift their fair chance of hiring practices in spite of the law or in support of the law of the land of California to really interrogate their um, policies around their background checks um, and being able to be more intentional around selecting the insurance providers that allow them to take more chances on employees from a standpoint of um, honoring the restorative justice programming that they went through in leadership development to be able to enter the workforce. Um, and last but not least, really ensure that this tremendous amount of, of talent that is being untapped can be shifted from, um, as you said, projected liabilities to society to known assets. And that's not just in the economy, but we understand that these transformative opportunities also impact not just the individual, but the households and families that they're in. So there's a multi-generational impact. So that's one example of how we worked with um, social innovation and also uh, the Price Center to really drive um, opportunity and innovation that um, advances systems change um, towards justice as relates to um, our economy. Thank you. Um, and I think this is a good point to bring Julio into the conversation. And um, I am wondering, Julio, how does your work um, in the last 20 years in L.A. County in terms of transforming the juvenile justice system, how does that pair with the work that Jeffrey is doing? 
Well, first, thank you, uh, uh, Brittany, for allowing me to be part of this conversation. Uh, no easy task to, to follow, Jeffrey. What I'm about to share with you is one of the things that often we don't talk about in L.A., that L.A. is number one for all the wrong reasons. Um, I started this work in 1998 um, as a uh, uh, staff member of the California Wellness Foundation, one of the largest health foundations um, uh, that was supporting uh, systems change work related to youth justice transformation. So in 1998, just to kind of give you a quick landscape of what the youth justice system looked like, we were number one, not in the, in the nation, but we were number one in the world. So in LA, on any given day, um, 5,500 young people, 98% of those young people, Black, Brown, Native, Indigenous young people were incarcerated across 23 youth prisons across the region. Right, so LA is home to 10 million people. We were home to 23 youth prisons. Each year, we were arresting between 30 to 35,000 young people, mostly young people of color. And we were spending hundreds of millions of years running a unfair, unjust, broken system. Imagine us using that money and letting Jeffrey uh, take $250 million a year and really illuminating pathways, career pathways, education pathways, uh, restorative justice pathways of success. But unfortunately, that's not what we did. And so for 20 years, there has been a significant uh, movement led by young people who've been directly impacted. The very communities that Jeffrey just talked about, young people from South LA, young people from the Antelope Valley, young people from Pomona, who again, really lifted up their own experience and understood and really for the first time, in my opinion, brought together a, an honest dialogue, right? So people often ask, well, how did we create such a, a large system, right? It, and, and when I respond to that, um, you know, I talk about that being, it was a political decision we made, right? Because if you looked at the data, the majority of young people who were entering the criminal legal system, 80% of them, at, even at that time, were eligible to be diverted, meaning they were being arrested for things that white kids on the West Side get sent home for, right? So they had an open container. They were, um, you know, chewing from school, these were, these were um, uh, in offenses that did not have a, a victim per se, and yet we were channeling Black, Brown, Native folks into a broken, harmful system that literally was reducing their ability to have any type of economic mobi mobility. And so, you know, our work at Liberty Hill uh, for the last five years has really been catalyzed by philanthropy to pursue a strategy, as Jeffrey mentioned, to shrink close and invest. We know that as we shrink the number of arrests, close juvenile halls and youth jails, that we will free up public funds to invest in a youth development system that really builds on the strengths of young people so that they have the resources and opportunities to thrive, right? And we've done that work diligently in partnership with community and government partners to clarify what it meant to really advance a racial equity, using a racial equity lens by shifting really the conditions within the county's youth justice system that we're holding problems in place and to really provide an actionable model to improve these partnerships amongst county agencies, youth development organizations, and other groups to, to really provide evidence-informed services to Black, Brown, Native young people who were in need. And so we knew that to be successful, it was critical for us to really focus on changing relationships and connections and power dynamics, as well as mental models in this work but we also knew to reach our North Star, which is to create the nation's largest youth development system. We also knew that we needed to build a capacity to support systems change internally and externally. And to follow up on um, the, the significance of political decisions, both for the work that you both do, um, I am wondering if you could both kind of speak to what are the barriers then that you have faced in doing this path-breaking work when it comes to really transforming the system? Well, I, again, I think, you know, oftentimes when you think about transformation, um, you think about root causes. And so we had to do a lot of work in partnership with academia to really understand where did we start from and how did we get there? What were some of the political decisions that really led to the this warehousing of young people in Los Angeles and what were the underlying reasons and again, there are many, many, many to, to, to go from. And I think what started to happen um, and where the change started to happen and where Liberty Hill started to, to really see this happening um, is really understanding um, and understanding where momentum lied. We were fortunate five years ago when we launched this work that there was a significant transformation of the Board of Supervisors, right? There was a change in leadership. 
uh, even now you have five women that are now representing uh, you know two million people across the LA County region. And so we had to really understand where the momentum and energy lied and where we needed to know where the arc of long-term change was gonna look like. And, and so these not only included the trends that I just mentioned, but the momentum closely related to transforming and shrinking the system. So for us, it, it was all kind of related to uh, adjacent social issues and the broader work that folks were doing on housing and workforce and, and education. So you know, we, we saw educational push out data we looked at the, the high unemployment rate of young people. And so this really cut across all these different issues. And we knew if we didn't explicitly surface and respond to these dynamics that we would miss opportunities to accelerate progress by really amplifying and supporting trends and really dampening the ones that can impede our efforts, right? So I think once or for all, we had people power, there was governance power, there was narrative power, and there was relationship power and that's why, you know, I think the work that you know we were uh, brought into in 2017, which again was a multi-pronged strategy, really allowed us to align and amplify and really accelerate a lot of those conversations and learnings about why LA really needed to look within itself and understand why we had created the largest harmful youth justice system in the world and how we were going to change that narrative. So two things were happening simultaneously. First of all, I think we had political representation that said. Once and for all, we don't want to be number one for that reason. So what can we do to reduce the number of young people entering the system? And more importantly, what was the alternative that we were going to put in place, right? Especially for hiding young people who needed support. They needed mental health support. They needed coaching and mentoring. They needed uh, an organization to provide and illuminate uh, pathways of success. And that's exactly what started to happen. And I'm really happy to report that soon uh, we will be home to the largest youth development department in the nation where we are utilizing hundreds of millions of dollars to support young people um, from birth to career. So I'm wondering too, um, Jeffrey, can you also speak to where does Leaders Up fit within this arc of the changing landscape and this this um, and the significance of the changing political landscape and sort of these windows of opportunity in terms of building coalitions with groups and actors across, that are trying to innovate and tackle different parts of the system? And so thank you. Um, as an intermediary, Leaders Up really focuses in on uncovering the unmet needs and the interests of a cross-section of stakeholders. And I think cross-sector collaboration is a key driving strategy of Leaders Up that helps us form powerful coalitions that can do the work on the ground, um, not just from an impact and intervention perspective, but also from a research perspective to actually drive policy and systems change. So having this, I call it grasshopper type capability where you are able to walk on the ground, um, grassroots, but also be able to advocate at the grad's tops level is a unique capability that Leaders Up deploys in order to, again, innovate. And I think it's important for us, um, and I've been really driving um, this language across our culture at Leaders Up from the board all the way across the team, is that we must dream like King, which is an anti-racist economy. I believe that the work of Dr. Martin Luther King at its tail end was really focused in on ensuring that America leverages its wealth to ensure the least of us have opportunities to not just meet their basic needs, to maximize their potential comprehensively, right? But also we must innovate like Disney. So how do we again innovate at the forefront to ensure that, you know, particularly young people of color, when we talk about uh, leaders up in our work, BIPOC young adults are not just surviving, but they are ahead of the curve. They are around the corner. So we're not just talking to organizations like Google around ensuring young people can compete in a digital economy, we're actually talking to Google about how do young people acquire the skills to actually compete in a virtual economy, NFT, blockchain, et cetera. So it's also incumbent upon us to stay at Leaders Up connected to innovation across all sectors and being able to then drive, again, that systems change. I was recently appointed by um, Supervisor Holly Mitchell, Chair of the Board of Supervisors, to be the uh, Commissioner of the LA County Workforce Development Board for the second district. So that's another role that we're able to play to now take innovations on the ground and now influence to Julio's point, you know, workforce sits at the intersection of youth development, economic development, and just holistic community transformation. Um, so being able to now take the innovations that we're driving on an ongoing basis at leaders of and have tested that are worthy for proof of, uh, worthy of scale and influence 
now a marketplace on the largest mar- the largest county and the largest economy in the lar- of the statewide economy in the nation um, to be able to really demonstrate what true equitable systems of opportunity look like, um, and how do you stay ahead again, especially in an economy like the uh, in LA County that is you know at the forefront of entertainment innovation and technology in, uh, innovation when we think about Silicon Beach. To follow up on that, I think one of the most impressive things about the work that you both do is that you've been able to be change makers and innovators within, arguably, if you're looking at the history of California and the rise of mass incarceration, um, really, uh, I would say, kind of hostile punitive attitudes, right? Um, in terms of what punishment should be like, who should be punished, uh, these very typical, um, as we call them, tough on crime politics. And so I think it's really important for our audience also to get a sense of, uh, in the work that you do, how do you approach the changing of minds when you encounter those who are resistant to these transformations, who are very uh, resistant to shifting attitudes and uh, shifting cultural norms when it comes to punishment in our country that we have been seeing and in, in, uh, in the wake of um, uh, racial protests, right? I, I'm, I'm very curious and I think we'd all want to know um, how do we change minds and, and to be able to get this work done? That's a great question. And so, you know, one of the things that I, you know, I, I do and I learn mostly from young people who have been directly impacted, right? So one of the things they often talk about is, and, and it's interesting, right? Because, you know, because of the global pandemic, now all of a sudden public health is like the, one of the first things we see in the news. And, and it's really taking a public health approach to understanding why young people were entering the system, really looking at root causes. It's very easy to simply focus on punishment, which is why in 1998, we had 23 youth prisons in LA. Right. We weren't doing the work on root causes. We weren't lifting up the fact that nine out of 10 young people who were entering the youth justice system had contact with the child welfare system. And we were criminalizing young people for their trauma. Right. So I think when you talk about narrative, that is a very powerful, um, uh, you know, I think the, the narrative that has been shaped out in L.A. the last five years is the reason why we no longer have 23 youth prisons. We actually have five and hopefully we'll have three because there's a lot of work to ensure that young people are getting the support they need. The 30,000 young people that we used to arrest, that number now last year was 4,000. Um, the number of young people that were incarcerated in 1998, which was about 5,500. As of this morning, there's 348 young people. We have really um, followed the lead of directly impacted communities to really map out and align what were the driving reasons, right? Number one, drive to South LA, go to a middle school and tell me what you see outside that school. You see police cars. Young people in South LA were being criminalized for being poor, being fed into this unjust, unfair legal system. And the narrative and the data, qualitative and quantitative have have come together to really outline that we don't need new technology to do the right thing. Right. We need political will and we need to support what works. Right. You know, if we were to literally transfer one hundred million dollars to leaders up, we would have amazing results without question. But yet that is a philosophical argument like, well, leaders up. We have to we have to ensure that they can handle one hundred million dollars, which is why one of the things that we've done that, again, really came from the organizing and the advocacy is that a few years back, you know, we had support from the probation department who also said that there are too many young people in under our jurisdiction and we're on the receiving end, meaning police are sending us young people who we believe should not be in juvenile hall. And so we worked with them to figure out then how do we divert them away from them? How do we support them and and put them in in a community setting where they're going to have good results? The challenge was is that a lot of organizations like Leaders Up it was nearly impossible for them to get a contract from the probation department because of all these restrictions and hurdles that you had to jump over. And so in response, um, you know, we partnered with the county and we created Ready to Rise, right, um, to really support a new way of contracting that hadn't been done before. Not rocket science. Literally, the county transfers money to a third-party administrator, third-party administrator that then supports small, mid-sized nonprofits 
to actually do what they've been doing all along, which is evidence-informed programming with young people, and we're seeing good results. So now, you know, the Board of Supervisors, the Probation Department, and other county agencies are saying, how do we replicate that? That could have been 20, that could, that could have been done 20 years ago. Um, and my point is, is that that narrative is also supporting more investments in the creation of this new Department of Youth Development that would not have been established 10, 15 years ago because we didn't have the political backbone to actually come to truth and reconciliation that in some way our practices were racist and we were targeting black, brown, native young people in LA. Well, Brittany, I just wanted to hop in with a quick um, plus up on that. I think in addition to what Julio says is that, you know, being tough on crime, we're entering back into that era. We also want to be tough on racism, you know? And what that means is that intentionally be choosing to be anti-racist at the individual level, at the firm level, across the community, and at the systems level. And I think, you know, what Dr. K- Abram Kendi want, uh, details out in how to be an anti-racist, we need more of an intentional strategy to train and support people around how to identify, describe, and dismantle racism as it permeates across our, uh, our society. This just being one area of issue and how Re- Leaders Up is addressing that is that we're building what we call our racial equity challenge. What we found is that across the nation right now, um, confidence, worker confidence and safety, whether that's physical safety, but more importantly, psychological safety is at an all time low in our country. So therefore, it means that the safe, the, inter, uh, the psychological safety and underpinning of all of this racist tension that we're having internally and externally in workforces need to be addressed. So we're really building out strategies and tools that folks can use both at the individual level and at the enterprise level, because the work that Julio is talking about is all supported by people. Um, and ensuring that people are transformed. I think your question is around shifting the minds and attitudes and behaviors of individuals. We have to learn a new practice. This is like national therapy that I think America needs to grapple with the brutal truth and the fact that we do come from a culture of racism. And if we're going to shift, and that's a huge change management strategy when we think about culturally, it starts at the individual unit level. And that's just not you know, for allies, that's for people of color, too, that also have to recognize they might be passively racist and not actively anti-racist in this work. So I just want to lift that up as an example of what Leaders Up is doing, but also to underpin what Julio is saying is that we have to also do the work across society and at the individual level to really push past this tipping point into another side of, of, of true justice for our country. Yeah, I want to plus one on that. Thank you, Jeffrey, for that. And again, I just want to say to your point, Brittany, around the narrative. I mean, it, look, it, just because I think the three of us have been in this space for a long time, and I think the research speaks, you know, to this point, it's easier and less threatening to condemn violence morally and legally so that we can punish it rather than seeking its causes and working to prevent it. But to Jeffrey's point, to actually speak truth about how we have, in LA have, have, have treated black, brown, native indigenous folks, right? It is much easier to deflect that conversation and really figure out how to put more resources on this other infrastructure that always gets pulled out. Um, you know, I, I shared something recently. Um, it was a data point that really looked at the trend of youth arrests in LA County and, it, and there's been a 70% decline um, from just 10 years ago, right? So it, obviously if you see this line, and what I said is like, you wouldn't know it by watching the news. Because when you watch the news right now, you you get 24 hour coverage of smash and grab. And again, that is not to condone it. That is not to say it's okay. But the reality is, is that there is a medium narrative right now that is highlighting certain crimes, but how come we're not talking about corporate crime or wage theft? by corporations? How come that's not on the front page? How, that, that causes hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for, yuck, for people that we care deeply about, but yet we're not going after, you know, corporate folks who, again, are, um, you know, wage theft is increasingly uh, on the rise, but yet we focus in on the local news, which, again, is not showing a trend that young people are actually um, doing, you know, uh, much better than they were a decade ago because of the system change work that many of our community members have been a part of that have been driving these solutions, right? More investments in in mental health, more uh, support for educational support, more coaching for black students in LA Unified. For the first time, LA Unified now has $35 million 
to support Black youth, but that had to come through an organizing campaign, right, after the murder of George Floyd. So all that to say is that narrative is a powerful tool, and that's why we have to invest in the narrative infrastructure so that people are actually hearing the good stuff, like Jeffrey's work, right? Why isn't Jeffrey's work on the front page? How come we're not hearing about the amazing partnerships, all the young people who are benefiting from that work? We tend to not hear about that, and that has to change. That is so powerful because um, it is so true that really the, the media construction of reality is, is very powerful in this country when it comes to the narrative on, on crime and control. Um, and I, as a follow-up question for you both, um, what I'm hearing as a theme really is the, the importance of speaking truth um, in the midst of these tough on crime narratives. And uh, especially to your, your earlier points, um, Jeffrey, and your follow-up, Julio, um, I, I wanted to know, do you face resistance at all um, to explicitly naming race and racism as causes of the systems that you are dismantling? And the reason I ask this is because um, much work has shown that we are now in an era where it is uh, institutions and organizations are hesitant to name race, uh, believing that we are in a post-racial America, right? Or this belief that we're now in a colorblind society. Um, have you at all faced any of these um, attitudes in your work? Um, and if so, how do you, um, negotiate that and how do you work past it? We just talk facts. Yes, we have received pushback, but when you just look at our economy through the lens of race, we're missing out on $2.4 trillion of our GDP because of racial disparities across the systemic drivers of the racial wealth gap. So let's talk about the economics of this. And that's a fact, the numbers don't lie. So there are systemically systemic barriers that are key are withholding, you know, uh, economic prosperity based upon race. Beyond that, uh, we really talk about now that we understand that it's a fact. What is your work to do to own that and become an anti-racist and an ally? When you when folks of color are in the room and not out and, and out of the room. And, um, you know, we have a tremendous, we, that is some work at Leaders Up. We've done a lot of, of, of development um, and training of our board of directors and our entire team uh, because we're a diverse team. And traditionally in nonprofit sectors, most nonprofit boards are run by non-people of color. We've worked a lot to diversify our board. Um, Dr. Painter is a member of our board of directors as well. Um, and he has been equipped and empowered and walked into the room with understanding how to be an ally. Um, and has demonstrated that to other of his uh, of his peers across the board. But it's important, again, that we challenge and speak truth to power around, you know, the individual change that's necessary. And then the leadership moment that is necessary for folks to continue to not just advocate, but then, again, to be able to describe, identify, describe and dismantle these practices, policies and behaviors that perpetuate racism. Yeah, I mean, I think something similar. So I interface with, you know, obviously uh, folks in government and I interface obviously with philanthropy. And so I would say from philanthropy to Jeffrey's point, um, race is very uncomfortable in those conversations for a lot of foundations who have never even referenced it, call that out. And again, I think what happened after the murder of George Floyd is a lot of folks put out statements. Well, we held their feet to the fire. Like, what's the action from your statement? How will you center and use a race equity lens in everything that you do, especially around this youth justice and youth development work, which was interesting because, you know, we raised, you know, through our partnership, you know, we supported um, 13 groups. These were the frontline advocacy and organizing groups that created the youth justice reimagined blueprint that the L.A. County is now uh, implementing to create the nation's largest youth development system. That came from community, right? That didn't come from county agency heads or staff that came from community in partnership um, with them. And we were able to raise seven and a half million dollars from 19 different foundations. But what was interesting is that 80% of our funding partners joined a collaborative when it felt safer versus funding the, the organizations directly because a lot of the organizations were very unapologetic 
about Black leadership, you know, being centered, talking about Black, Brown, Native young people, um, and they weren't going to shy away from that. So it was interesting where philanthropy landed. Of course, we have, you know, uh, folks like the California Endowment, California Wellness, uh, who do an amazing job of, of centering race, and we're comfortable. But the majority of folks um, joined a collaborative, a collective, where to Jeffrey's point, um, it was their way of being an ally. And one of the things I've said to them is that, you know, change happens when you take two steps past your comfort zone. We need you to go from ally to, you know, freedom fighter. And people are like, well, what does that mean? Right. And so, you know, going from an ally to freedom fighter is really using your platform to elevate and center those that have been directly impacted and letting them lead. Right. It's actually giving up power. And so we've seen significant um, power being transferred to the community, not as much as I had liked, but there's still power being transferred um, where, young, where, you know, organizations themselves are dictating how philanthropic dollars are spent um, specifically for this youth justice work. On the government side, you know, I, we now have a new office of anti-racism and equity and initiative led by, led by Dr. Tanian Sforza, who's one of our community partners. Um, and, and so for me, that conversation has been really interesting because I think it depends on the level of conversation and depending on what day of the week. If you're in a Measure J conversation, you're absolutely talking about, um, you know, race, right? This was the ballot initiative that um, was launched after the murder of George Floyd, where 2.1 million people voted the affirmative to basically use 10% of uh, county unrestricted resources to support that alternative. That specifically says the dollars will support uh, black and brown communities across LA. So, you know, again, Brittany, I think there's movement on that, but to, you know, Jeffrey's um, point, there's an opportunity and a responsibility that we have to move folks um, from the sideline to being an ally. But there's always resistance, Brittany. Well, we also have to ensure, Brittany, that as people of color and historically um, historically under-resourced communities, not historically marginalized, but historically under-resourced communities, that you uh, there's trauma and transformation that comes from being consistently exposed to oppression. So I think part of also this is also, again, um, the owning that we all have a work, work to do in untangling this knot of racism and oppression. And even in philanthropy or from a business perspective, I, as, as a social entrepreneur, I had to also be, be clear from my perspective. There's a practice that if someone is pitching to do business with you, you ask them to do a prompt, like if they're a graphic designer, graph, um, develop me something as a sample of your work. Well, we said, well, that is inequitable because someone is working for us. So we should pay them for that, even if we like it or not. But the reality is if you're asking someone to do work, you have to pay them for it. That is a, a, a practice we had to change at Leaders Up in order to drive our commitment to equity. So I think there's all there's work for every leader to do around this. Uh, but at the end of the day, part of that is, to, to, to Julio's point, being able to give up power in order to make room for folks that have been historically under-resourced. Because if we were resourced, to Julio's point, a lot of things would be different because we would have the power to normalize the things that help us thrive. Thank you. Um, I I think that as we're we're getting close to the Q and A to follow up on both of your comments, I I think um, I just have one uh, final question. It's kind of a just to bring us to that point. Um, I think that the room would be really interested in in knowing to for yourselves, like how did you what brought you to this work. How did you end up to this place where you are in working for transformation? Um, and then we can open it up for q and I um, went to UCLA. Um, I'm from the uh, San Francisco Bay or East Bay. Um, and at the time in Richmond, California, was the murder capital of the country. Um, and despite that, with support, I was able to go to UCLA and then be in, interjected into, I know I'm at a USC event, so I had to mention UCLA Bruins. I did. Um, but nonetheless, West, the Westwood is very different than South LA. And the 10 freeway is what I call like the quality of life Mason Dixon line in, uh, in this LA County. Farther south and east you go below the 10 freeway, the more resources drain up. Um, and when I was at UCLA, I was able to experience this true dichotomy um, and being able to work at the Urban League. I was introduced to Starbucks to get the opportunity to launch leaders up with a $1 million investment. 
And what fuels my work, Dr. Freeman, to keep moving this forward is that when I reached Seattle, executives said to me, someone that was selected by CEO of the foundation uh, of the foundation of Starbucks, et cetera, their peer, um, you're the exception. You're not like the rest of the folks in your community. So what fuels me to do this work, and not just brought me to do this work, but to fuel me to do this work is that I no longer want to be the exception. I want to be the standard. You should be able to be a young man of color or a person of color or a queer man. You be able to maximize your potential no matter what zip code you were born in. So the work that we're doing here is especially around you know, transforming and shrinking the mass incarceration system and growing a structure of opportunity is tantamount to just bringing to life my own personal theory of change. Yes. Change the odds, not beat the odds. Um, much like Jeffrey, this is personal for me. I grew up in, in Pacoima, which is in the northeast part of the San Fernando Valley, one of the most over-policed, over-incarcerated communities in L.A. Uh, we have the distinction of being uh, L.A. city gang reduction uh, zone. We're also an L.A. county gang reduction um, zone. And so, you know, what I saw growing up was more young people um, channeled into uh, the youth justice system, including my older brother. And so I was fortunate to have the support of nonprofits and folks like Jeffrey, who illuminated a pathway for me. I was really good in school, uh, but my focus even in school was on social justice. You know, I started doing early research on the overrepresentation of young people in the juvenile justice system. And like Jeffrey, uh, I'm a Bruin. And I also wanted to figure out um, how to succeed and change the odds for a lot of the young people who'd never had that same opportunity uh, in my neighborhood, uh, which they don't often get to, to, to know or interact with anybody that has a college education, but they know um, many people who've been in prison. And, you know, and I'll end with this, that for me, this is year 23. And a year ago, I lost my brother. He was 49 years old. And we had had a, a traumatic event early in our life. And the way I medicated was with work. The way my brother medicated was, was alcohol. Um, he was a gay Latino man rejected by our own family. So already, you know, that was something that he was navigating. Um, and he made a mistake, never been involved with the law, was arrested. He was sent to prison for four years. He never recovered, right? If anything, the, the trauma was exacerbated. He went in um, needing mental health support and he came out, um, you know, unfortunately and uh, broken um, on so many different levels. And we lost him at age 49. And so for me, um, I know many uh, people like that. In 23 years, I spent a lot of time talking and learning from individuals that are currently incarcerated. Most of my mentees are young men who've been incarcerated at an early age and basically the same trajectory, right? We didn't invest when they needed help. We sent a, a, a police officer, not a, a child, um, uh, uh, you know, somebody who would support their, their pain and trauma. So for me, um, my personal, my professional life are intertwined. And I'm committed to um, making, you know, a system that, again, is unfair and really trying to dismantle that and put something better in its place so that we have more young people who are thriving, um, not more young people who are being traumatized. Thank you so much, um, Julio. And thank you so much, Jeffrey, uh, for sharing, um, just really sharing um, these your powerful, the powerful impact that the organizations are doing, and also for sharing um, at the end here, your stories in terms of how you came to do this work, this freedom fighting work, as you said, Julio, to use your words. Um, I, I think we all really appreciate um, the work that you are doing and being able to sit here and learn um, from you both. I would now like to open it up uh, for Q&A. So uh, this is for all. What resources literature would you recommend for individuals and leaders in organizations looking to do more introspective work and up their game as an ally and freedom fighter? Jeffrey, you want to go first? Sure. I would pick up the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and, and start there to really understand the frame of how to be an anti-racist. Um, I would be curious and immerse yourself in different cultural experiences so that you gain proximity as well. Because part of the work is just being curious and listening and learning and engaging. Um, and then beyond that, I would stay on the lookout, um, join the Leaders Up mailing list because we'll be launching the second iteration of our racial justice challenge, a racial equity challenge that is a four week program that allows individuals who wanna take this journey 
and go deeper down the pathway of being an effective ally and advocate. Um, it gives you tools, resources, and actionable steps you can take in your everyday life at work to show up as an anti-racist ally at work. Yeah, I mean, just given the topic that we have been discussed, which is the youth justice and youth development work for me personally, you know, I, I'm going to put in the chat, um, which is the, the roadmap that is being co-written uh, as we speak by young people who are directly impacted in partnership with LA. Read the report, stand up for them. Um, you know, we're going to have to fight for full funding for the Department of Youth Development. As I shared with you, for 20 years, we have spent billions and billions on the back end. Here is an opportunity to spend billions on the front end. And so definitely read the report, um, sign up to, to support the LA Youth Uprising Coalition, which I'll put a link into. But that to me is something that you can immediately do to be an ally for this work. Thank you, Brittany. Do you wanna share a resource? Uh, a resource that comes to mind would be, um, and it's it's by a, a colleague, um, Patrick Lopez Aguado, um, who's actually at Santa Clara, and I think it's applicable because his research is um, it's an ethnography of his time spent with youth um, in juvenile detention in the Bay Area, and then following them home. And so the book is called "Stick Together and Come Back Home," um, and and I think for for those interested in and. And learning and, and being an ally, I think this book is just really illuminating um, in the words of the youth who experienced it and what it's like to go back to communities that are over-policed and hyper-incarcerated. Thank you for sharing those resources. Um, Edmundo, do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much um, to everyone on this panel. Thank you for the passion, the answers, and Gulila, thank you for sharing that story. Um, I think my question is, you've explained so well the, the landscape in Southern California and LA and what needs to happen to make that change. I was wondering if you could talk about the federal policy level and what you think needs to happen on that and what you want to see within maybe the next 10 years. Yeah, I can hop in just on a just real tactical level. I think as we're thinking about build back, as we're advancing Build Back Better and infrastructure um, investment, being able to classify investment resources for the re-entering population, being able to classify also to the point of Julio's uh, example of youth development services at the countywide level that exposes young people to those good quality career pathway jobs and opportunities become an essential element. So just ensuring that there are provisions in infrastructure and appropriations that allocate resources for I think re-entering students, uh, citizens and communities that were highly impacted by the war on drugs become just key lenses to always examine policy at the federal level group. Yeah, I would say an immediate opportunity is uh, right now, uh, actually on Thursday, um, as I mentioned during the call, Measure J, which is now called Care First, the Care First initiative is actually negotiating how to spend um, $200 million of dollars, including federal resources, that include significant um, support for the uh, re-entering population. And so that's an opportunity for folks like you all to, to participate and to join and support. Again, a lot of folks that are fighting, right? They're fighting for uh, equity in these resources. There are billions and billions of dollars that will come into LA County from the state and the federal government. And so how are we positioning um, and ensuring that the right voices will be at the table? And, and in addition to that, unlocking those resources, right? So as I shared with you, Ready to Rise was a, was a pilot uh, around um, undoing the harmful, uh, and I call racist contracting practices, um, and making it fair for nonprofits to access those dollars. Because it's one thing for this money to flow in, but if you can't access it, we're going to have some significant issues. So how do we lift up and support this third-party administrator role um, across the county to ensure that um, there is equitable distribution of these federal dollars coming into L.A.? Thank you so much. Uh, Penelope, do you want to un, um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, thank you so much. And I want to thank all the speakers, uh, you know, for sharing everything today. This has been just so interesting to listen to. I'm a USC Price alum myself. And so my question as a researcher uh, in this field is, how do you recommend incorporating participatory action research that's youth-led with quantitative research? Thank you very much, uh, Penelope, for your question. Um, I think in terms of pairing different um, types of research, I would say first, it would involve um, really 
building partnerships and trust and transparency with organizations that work with youth. Um, I think that when trying to answer specifically how questions in terms of how transformation happens and how um, processes and policies are implemented, you really qualitative research in the form of um, participatory or, or um, uh, really collaborative research um, with organizations and with um, communities is, is paramount in order to be able to answer those questions. And so I think the first to first uh, really um, answer that, I think you, you, it, it comes down to building connections and building community. Um, and what's key is, is in doing that in a way that is not extractive. It's not extractive of information of organizations and communities and youth, but instead um, building and supporting their work. Um, and so, for example, I have a number of students who are doing this sorts of work with organizations. I also did this sort of work um, in my own research um, on, on, Cal on the California prison system. Um, and it comes down to finding out what do the organizations also need uh, and not solely what you need as the researcher. And so for myself and for my students, um, like we've routinely shared our findings, um, just basically having an open door of transparency um, versus simply taking what we need to find and moving forward. It's more of a collaboration um, so that the organization is also able to use our work and has access to our work uh, without barriers. And so I think in pairing that with quantitative research, you could really, um, really work towards transformation uh, with groups um, in terms of pairing those two methods. Yeah, I just want to comment that I think that um, the, and have experienced that the social innovation process in itself is a good intersection point between quantitative research and participatory research especially when you get into the co-design elements of things. But it's, before getting into the co-design element output, you know, there's a number of areas where you can uh, really ensure that the folks impacted by the, the work. Um, and I think, Dr. Friedman, another element is that human-centered design becomes a key element to any research project because at the end of the day, we want the research to be useful. And that is one of the things I do appreciate about USC and compared to Julio in my alma mater is that there's a lot more intention around taking, breaking down the walls of academia so that this research becomes a campus where all have access um, to not just extracting knowledge, um, but also contributing to the knowledge set. And I think that's a critical point of also addressing, you know, and D. Uh, and making an anti-racist culture on campuses of, 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 of scholarly work of ensuring that, you know, we're recognizing human experience and the lived experience of communities as just as vital as, you know, a, a, a much more rigorous, you know, um, research methodology. Yeah, I would say on the justice work, the, the reports that I was referencing, there's a report called You Justice uh, Reimagined. And then there's also the Alternatives to Incarceration Roadmap, which to, I believe is probably the most um, well thought out uh, roadmap and blueprint to build the alternative. Again, 10, 15 years ago, we probably would have got it from academia, but this time it was led by, again, the very communities that have been impacted in partnership. So academia wasn't in front, right? They were a partner. And I think that is something that we continue to utilize, especially on the youth justice front. Um, we have a, a youth justice consortium of, of uh, academics that have been very supportive, folks from SC and UCLA and Cal State ULA, uh, Cal State LA. But again, more but more responsive, more participatory. Our Ready to Rise work is evaluated by Loyola Marymount, and it's a participatory evaluation where the participants themselves are lifting up the outcomes and the model, the modalities of success, and then the evaluators are coming in and really supporting them along the way. So for us, that's been an essential ingredient to the success of this work. Because as you know, Brittany, you know, oftentimes we have to lift up and say that we have academic support in order for it to be validated, to, for it to be uh, seen as successful. And to be quite frank, our Ready to Rise work, which started in 19 as a three and a half million dollar pilot, now it's a $40 million initiative. I don't think we get there without the support of LMU and their research team. 
Thank you all. We, it looks like we have one more question, but we have time for another one if people want to add one in. Uh, Ricardo tells us that yesterday the county's board of supervisors approved the creation of a new justice care and opportunities department which will consolidate justice, justice reform efforts and data collection analysis that were previously housed in several other departments. What opportunities does that create for innovation? Well, first of all, uh, kudos to Ricardo. I, I'm, a, I'm a board agenda nerd, so I, I've been working uh, behind the scenes on this motion for some time now, and oftentimes you don't um, hear people monitoring uh, the board agenda closely. So this is a, uh, this is a, a motion that came from um, Supervisor Kuhl, and because of what happened the last five years, there's a lot of new divisions now, right? We have the Office of, Divi Div the Office of Diversion and Reentry under Health and Human Services. We have the new ATI office. We have the Anti-Racism Initiative, which is an office. We have the Division of Youth Diversion and Youth Development. We now have a Department of Youth Development. And so part of what this does, and you know, not everybody agrees, even though the motion passed, there was a lot of pushback from the community um, number one, because the department now includes the word or has words that don't really focus on the health piece, which was essential, right? Uh, because it's looking at the criminal legal system and really the need to support health and centering health as a part of that, um, that mission statement. So yes, there will be many opportunities to really think about um, working across these divisions so that there's no, you know, it's like, there's too many silos right now, right? The left doesn't know what the right is doing. And so we're hoping that because of the consolidation um, and, and time will tell whether or not this will happen, that there will be more opportunities to really think outside the box because now you've unified the different divisions with the sole purpose of creating and supporting that, that alternative. But to be determined, um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And whenever you create a new department, um, there's a lot of bureaucracy that comes with that. So it's the, the, the devil's in the details. Um, and so we'll see, you know, how that um, plays out. I will just add, um, I, I, I did not know that that was happening. And I, that, I think that that sounds like um, a wonderful opportunity, as you said, Julio, to be able to actually see the full scope of issues because of the consolidation, because often there really is this lack of information sharing across silos. And oftentimes departments are working on very similar or inter- are definitely interconnected problems, um, but do not have the full capability to tackle them without having the integrated knowledge and the integrated um, team to actually think through the solutions as one. Uh, so I think that that certainly does create significant opportunities for innovation. And I hope um, to hear more about how it goes moving forward. And I would hope Julio as the, um that we're operationalizing this new effort, that we're really investing in understanding that this is a seismic change management strategy. So the points around integration goes beyond, you know, meeting, but also to like, what is the core strategy now that integrates all of the core capabilities of these agencies to generate outcomes, both preventative and intervention outcomes around, you know, transforming this, these coordinated services to services that a system that rehabilitates and develops, you know, rather than to the point of this conversation, penalizes and set folks back um, and, and, and detaches them from the mainstream economy. I think Commissioner Wallace, that's a perfect opportunity for you to yield your commission hat and hold a conversation about that very issue. But that's going to be essential, Jeffrey. I think that absolutely you hit it right on the target. But you know, I think that's a, an opportunity for Commissioner Wallace to actually bring county folks and, and have a direct, open, transparent conversation about that very point. Exactly. Thank you so much. That was our last question. With that, I'll pass it back to Gary Painter to close us out. Thank you so much, Caroline. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Friedman, Julio, Jeffrey. Um, I think what was so powerful to me as a, a director of the Price Center and, and, and someone who has an opportunity to work with, with folks like all of you in the field is that you've actually demonstrated the roadmap for how we can see change happen um, in all the different elements. And I, I just want to emphasize, Julio, the work that you've done with many, many, many partners, um, I think is a, just a tremendous example of how you can transform a system that was really placing barriers and harm on so many young adults to a youth development system. It it's been remarkable 
over the last decades. It, it's nothing short of that. And I think what's really interesting to me, um, for those of you who were at the beginning of the talk and thinking about the process of social innovation is how much you emphasize the need for authentic co-production with people who were experiencing the impacts of a system that was against them and to turn it into a system that is, is, is for them and for their development. Um, and I think we all can reflect on where have our processes of change broken down? Was it at the beginning where 20 years ago, you would have asked Dr. Friedman and maybe myself in a different area, probably not, uh, not the criminal legal system to come to a room and give you the ideas. Um, that's no longer the case. We know that isn't going to give us the best results. It's important as a partnership for the research that Dr. Friedman presented to us today. Like I said, it itself was something I simply didn't know. And we have to know these things so in order for, to actually engage in social change efforts. Um, and so we've learned a lot about how to co-produce better solutions. We're learning how to pilot to learn quickly. And rather than kind of taking a board motion and then we're gonna do one pilot after a board motion, and then five years later assess that, we know that, that does, that's not really piloting, that's not innovation. But we're beginning to appreciate how we can pilot to learn in a posture that is much more rapid. And I think, you know, I really appreciate the work that you've been funding and, and the work that Jeffrey is doing at Leaders Up to kind of lean into that, uh, that process. And yet, even if there are good ideas out there, we know that there remain barriers to scaling those ideas and then ultimately really diffusing them into systems. The fact that so many people simply don't know of the work that you've done, you know, Julio, with so many partners to make, to do this transformation from, you know, detention to development means that we're not actually diffusing it into our systems, into our knowledge, and we don't actually comprehend the tremendous benefit that is to our community. And so I invite everyone here who's with us today to um, just join in this work. If this is the space that you are, are working in, um, you know, please feel free to reach out and we'll help make any contacts that, that we might have. And as you can see here, the distinguished panel has many, many more. I also wanna invite everyone to come back in two weeks to focus on issues in and around education inequality, and then two, years, two weeks after that around housing insecurity. And again, final, finally, this 10th anniversary Social Innovation Summit will culminate in an April 27th event on campus at USC. So thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to the next time.